Why, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, no matter what time zone you're beaming in from. Welcome to the Optic Webinar. It's our last webinar before we begin the full Optic Conference. Uh, we're going to be starting the program very soon. I have a very uh, important speaker to introduce to all of you very soon. Uh, before we start the program, it's going to warm up a little bit and say that we're two days away from Optic and wow, are things heating up here in July in New York City. Uh, we've been compiling all the presentations, putting things together, fine tuning everything. And it's, it's really, um, really thrilled to be producing this year's Optic 2021, hopefully our last virtual one, and it's going to be off the hook. So um, this Sunday, I, I took off and I went to Central Park with my, my lovely dog, Eisenhower, my wife, Barbara, and I grabbed from my camera cabinet a Canon T90 with a 100 millimeter F4 macro lens. In honor of this week's webinar and George Lapp, I went out and shot with a, with a film camera and a manual focus camera with a lens. And as I was going about shooting the flowers and whatnot, and, and my puppy Eisenhower, I really, the lessons that I learned from, from a small cadre of writers in the 80s guided me this Sunday as I made my work. Uh, leading that pack was a man named George Lepp. Uh, he had written books, articles in all the magazines at the time. And I want you to understand that this is before YouTube, when you wanted to figure things out and get information, you had to read and you had to get in there and you went to your camera store and they had special books in Iraq. And there was George Lepp's book. Uh, is, it was great to pick up popular photography and, and read articles, outdoor photography. And uh, George is, is one of the guys who you read pretty frequently and really taught you. He's a perfectionist. He really understands equipment. He's a Canon explorer of light. And we are super happy to have him here at Optic. He had been to B&H in the event space a couple of times, but this is a, a very special opportunity allowing me to introduce the incredible George Lepp. And also in addition to George Lepp, we also have Eric Stoner from Canon, senior technical rep. He's going to be handling the Q&A. If everyone could keep their questions, uh, put them into the Q&A box or put them into the chat. And we're going to get to Q&A at the end of this. It's probably going to go a little over 3 o'clock Eastern time. But you guys are in for it. It's going to be great. George Lepp, welcome. Eric Stoner, welcome to the virtual stage of the Optic webinars. Well, good morning, and I guess some people it's good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm Eric Stoner from Canon, and couldn't be happier to uh, to see my friend George Lepp today. It's going to be an amazing uh, presentation, and also, of course, uh, none of this would be possible without David Brommer and B&H. So thank you to them. Uh, I'm going to get off camera now and let George present all of his amazing material, and I'll be back at the end for the Q and A. So thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Eric. George, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scram as well and let you take over. Thank you so much for coming, sir. All right. I'm going to go ahead here and bring up my program. We're going to talk about telephoto lenses today, and uh, we're going to use them in the extreme. We're going to use them even pretty much a macro or at least close-up photography at 500 millimeters, that might surprise you. But uh, we'll also talk about techniques. We won't just talk about the Canon lenses, we're gonna talk about techniques. So why on earth are we needing, why are so many nature photographers, wildlife photographers so into these big long lenses? Well, we wanna get close subjects larger, as you can see here by this peony, which was taken at 500 millimeters at the closest focus of the uh, RF 100 to 500. And we want distant subjects to be closer to us, uh, reach out, and we call it reach. And we'll talk about that here as well. My history of working with telephoto lenses and wildlife photography, I've been a pro for more than 50 years. So I've gone through quite a bit of equipment. I did start with Nikon way back in the day when I was going through school, which is over 50 years ago. And then back in about 1986, I, I switched over to Canon and the T90, was the, was the camera of choice and one of the reasons I made the switch. And only about a year later, we ended up going into the uh, 
EOS uh, SLRs. One of the things about the T90 was that I could use the 500 millimeter lenses that were out at that time, which uh, 500 longer lenses were hard to come by. Well, after uh, 1989, we actually had pro SLRs, the EOS one started there. Then we went to the first uh, DSLR, which was the D30. When we got to the D60, I switched over completely to digital and that was about 2001. Other important things that have happened over the years, the in two, four, two, uh, 2014, we, we had a really good 100 to 400 and I'd use that lens extensively with the uh, DSLRs. And in 2018, I moved up to a 600 millimeter F4 Mark III. The Mark III is important because it's lighter, it's a little bit sharper, it's a fabulous lens. And I'm using that today along with the 100 to 500 you see in the bottom, the bottom right corner. And we've got some new things we're gonna talk about in the uh, STM lenses, the RF 600 and the RF 800. So we'll talk about those as well. Before we get into the lenses, let's talk first about camera bodies because the telephoto lenses don't give us all the things we really want unless they do certain things for us. And the autofocus capabilities are really important. And the new cameras, the new R cameras are incredible in that area, especially the R6 and R5. We need ISO capabilities. We need to work in the 1600, 3200, 6400 areas to get enough light into the sensor. We want frame rates. We want mechanical and electronic frame rates. I can now work up to 20 frames per second. And the word is that we'll have 30 frames per second here in, in not too long a distance with the R3. Resolution. Well, we can work at 20 megapixels, which works just fine and the R6 works there, but the R5 having 45 megapixels gives us some cropping ability. We want low light viewfinder capabilities because we're working with mirrorless and it's gonna show us what we're actually gonna get. In-body image stabilization, uh, up to eight stops of image stabilization with some lenses on the R6 and the R5. Uh, let's pretty much go to just a few of these things. We we'd spend all day here if we went on to everything, but the fact we're working with, and we're talking about the R6 and the R5 right now, the full frame capability of both of these cameras, uh, the size of the sensor, 20 megapixels with the R6 gives us great low uh, light capabilities. 45 megapixel sensor on the R5 gives me the ability to crop into the image. And that's been very important to me. The autofocus with the animal and eye detection on both cameras, uh, 12 frames per second manual, 20 frames per second electronic silent shutter. That could be very important. I'll be in a blind and I can be uh, four to six feet away from my subject. And I don't want that. Uh, I don't want to hear the shutter going off there at all. And again, the image stabilization. Keep in mind that the R6 has got the lower cost. A little bit later, we're going to talk about how to do some of this on a budget. Yeah, a lot of these lenses are like $13,000, $9,000, but we have other ways to do this. And we're going to talk about those too. So at $1,400 less than the R5, the R6 might be a choice for you. So what are we looking for in a telephoto lens? These are the first things I look at, no matter what telephoto lens I'm looking at, if it doesn't have sharpness, we're stopping right there. Uh, way back when, when I started, there was a particular 400 millimeter lens. It was sharp in the center. It was terrible out at the edges. And I went through two of them and then told the company, forget it. It's, they just aren't gonna work. We want reach. We're gonna talk about focal lengths, close focus. That can be very important if you're working with small subjects. We don't all shoot elephants and bison and stuff like that. We shoot hummingbirds and things of that nature. The weight, I'm getting older. Uh, I don't, and I've got a bad back to start with. So uh, the weight of this lens and walking around with it all day long can be a real issue. And again, that autofocus capability in that lens is gonna be very important. So let's go to sharpness. That was the first thing we said. Now, this is the R5. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about the R5 because that's what I use for everything I shoot today. Uh, I'll reference back to some of the other cameras I've shot with, I've owned the uh, RP, I've owned, I have an R. So we'll talk about those cameras as well. But here's the, R, here's the 100 to 500 at 500 millimeters with a 2X extender on it. 
That's a thousand millimeters. I'm in a blind, I'm in my backyard, and I wish you had the, the monitor set up like I have here with a 5K monitor, and you would see every single feather on this particular quail. I work with the big lenses as well. Uh, I've worked for the last uh, eight years on an eagle nest. And when the spring comes in, they lay their eggs. I'm out there with the 600. I'll show you some examples as we go later. I'll take you all the way out to 14,000 millimeters. And if you think that's crazy, it was. Uh, but the 600 with a 2X Mark III extender, 1200 millimeters. Uh, it's a wonderful way to work when something that needs this detail. I can do video, I can do stills. Uh, this is 1000 millimeters F8, I mean a thousandth of a second at uh, F8. So here's reach. Reach is all about the uh, how far out there you can get. So let's start with the 100 to 500, which is one of the lenses. So this is the uh, 100 millimeter. Those two eagles, which they this is a favorite uh, place where they sit. So I could set up and go through a number of lenses and things. So it was kind of a neat situation. So I shot them at 500. I photographed them at 500. I did not shoot them. And then I stuck it out to 500 millimeters. And you can see it's still not as close as I would like it to be. Pulled out the 600. Uh, it's better. Put a 2X on the 600. We're now at 1200 millimeters over here on the right. And uh, with that 2X extender, that, that gives us a pretty good shot. I would generally be happy with that. But you can actually, if you're using the EF lenses, you can add a, a 12 millimeter uh, extension tube in between the two, and you can use the 2X and the 1.4, and these lenses are so good. The R5 is, and the R6 is, give you such great quality with low light, 6400 ISO, but it's still looking wonderful. That's what I really wanted, and I was capable. that was capable within the equipment I had with me. So there's where we started at 100 millimeters. This is where I ended up at 1,680 millimeters. So I'm using everything I can possibly find in my bag when they start, you know, they're a long ways out. You can't get too close to some of these animals, these birds. So close focus, that was another thing I mentioned here was important. Well, these are a couple of the more important ones I've brought up in red here. You know, when Canon came out with the RF 600 STM and the RF 800 STM, uh, I was kind of wondering at F11 why we would be doing that, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. But the close focus for that RF 800 millimeter is uh, 19 feet, 69, let's say just under 20 feet. And I remembered working with the big 800, the one at the very bottom there, and I find out it's exactly the same distance. I was very surprised. The important thing here is the 100 to 500 will get me all the way to just under four feet. And at a 2X on there is still at just under four feet. Now you have a thousand millimeters, you're this close, a small subject like a hummingbird, all of a sudden you can do headshots. Uh, the 600 that I use is about 13 and three quarter feet. It, generally those subjects are out quite a bit of a distance. So I mentioned hummingbirds, this is the one to 500. Uh, 2X extender, 1,000 millimeters, under four feet. Uh, I'm shooting through two panes of glass. I have a couple of strobes set up on the feeder. And because of this lens and everything, I can do headshots. I mentioned weight was important. It's very important to me. Well, the important lenses here are the RF again, 600 and 800, two pounds for the 600 two and three quarter pounds for the 800. Look at the 800 down at the bottom, it's 10 pounds. Now, sometimes we need that monster lens and that speed at five, six, but uh, I purchased the uh, 800 and I could walk around with it like it was nothing and it was really great. The 100 to 500 is only uh, three and a third pounds with the collar on it. I think that's very important as well. So when you're choosing these lenses and if you're a small frame, if you've got a bad back, uh, and you want to do a lot of hiking, you might want to consider these lighter lenses. How about the autofocus capabilities? We mentioned that's also very important with these uh, lenses that we're working with here. The uh, five, uh, 100 to 500, 
with the R5, I've photographed this owl. This is a uh, controlled bird photographing it coming off from a, uh, a perch. It's used in an educational show. Uh, I know where it's gonna come from, so it makes it much easier. But I put it in DPP, uh, the Canon software, and it, if you click on one of the buttons in there, you can actually see what sensors were used when you took that picture. And this is definitely an animal AF mode, and it helped me get this shot. It didn't quite see the eyes in the eye mode. Uh, here's, I did the same thing here. I brought it into DPP, and it showed me that I used, I had the eye control, and it put it right on the eyeball of this uh, scrub jay that was in my backyard. 1200 millimeters on this one with a 600 millimeter with a 2X. Again, I'm in a blind, 3,000th of a second in order to keep his movements uh, stopped and uh, worked out really well. So the, the long range zoom telephotos that we're working with out here, and these are Canon lenses, the 100 to 400, uh, which is still a very viable lens because with an adapter, it will work on the, uh, R, the R series cameras as well as on all of the EF and the, uh, the previous DSLRs. But the RF 100 to 500 is one I'm using today. It works really well. The 200 to 400, I've only worked very a little bit with, and it has a 1.4 converter into it. I'm not gonna talk much about that particular lens, but uh, we will talk about the other ones that are up here. So here's some more examples of what you can do with these hummingbirds if your lens will focus close. This is that 100 to 400. Uh, again, it can be used on the uh, R series with the adapter. And uh, I'm using extenders on these lenses and the extenders work on these zooms quite well. I'm very surprised. The one in the very dead center there is the 100 to 400 with a uh, 1.4, that's 560 millimeters. I'm going down to F22 and you'll see some of the other ones are F32 because I need the depth of field and these lenses hold together in their diffraction beautifully, even stopped way down. And you can see on the other ones, one of them here is at 800 millimeters and the other one is at 742 millimeters. Again, through two panes of glass and we're still getting this kind of feathered detail. It works. So the R5 and the 100 to 500, I'm using it out in the field. This is again at the uh, Desert Museum, which is very close to where I live here in Bend, Oregon. And they're practicing with these birds for the uh, educational program. These are all control birds. They cannot be returned to the wild. So this is not a game farm. This is uh, a show for, for education. And this is I detect electronic shutter. I'm getting 20 frames per second. 3,000th of a second, F11, so I have a little bit of depth of field. This gives me everything I'm looking for to give me the possibility of this, this kind of a photograph. So I was very pleased with the results I got. Uh, occasionally the hawks show up in my backyard above my bird feeders and I'll grab the camera. I'll, I'll have a 2X sitting on the counter with the 100 to 500. I can step outside and I've got a thousand millimeters. I can hand hold it. And he's definitely sees that I'm there. He's looking me in the eye. So what about close focus? What about, this is not a macro lens, but at the same time, I'm working in an area that has uh, flower beds and I can't step into the flower beds with these peonies. So what I'm able to do is to set up on a tripod, I'm doing focus bracketing. We'll talk about focus bracketing here in a moment. I'll give you some uh, ideas on how to use it. This is 35 images put all together. The lens is at 500 millimeters and it is at under four feet from that flower. And what you're seeing, what you're seeing here is a crop of this image and notice here, and I think you can see my arrow here, that there's this little uh, bug sitting in here. It's a flower thrip and you can see his antenna and everything else. And that is a major crop of this image. And uh, it's sharp, no, no doubt. So somewhat of a macro lens. Here's some other examples from that same day. Uh, again, it's, it's a demonstration garden here in Oregon. 
and I'm shooting uh, peonies and irises and lupins and rhododendrons. And I'm using this 100 to 500. And all of these images were done at 500 millimeters at different distances. Uh, the one here of the lupin that you'll see here, that's several images. This is a six images across the image and then put together in Photoshop. So what about focus bracketing? Well, I want to I want to get a number of images taken. I, I want it to be sharp all the way through from the beginning to the end. So you go to your back menu, your first menu here. You go to number five, and up comes focus bracketing. You enable it, and once you've enabled it, you get how many shots are you going to take, and how far does the focus travel at each of these shots in order to overlap them. Once you hit number of shots, this menu comes up. You can go from two all the way to 9,999 images. And then once you've gotten that chart, you decided what you want to do there, you go to the focus increment and up comes this menu and you choose anything from a one, which is very tiny movements to a 10, which would be huge movements. I generally stay all the way down here at a small movements because look down here at the bottom, you can have too few a shots and you won't, get the, you won't get the sharpness, but never too many. So, hey, keep it, keep it short and uh, your sharpness will be incredible, like the one I just showed you with, with 35 different images on it. So here's an example. I'm in this uh, demonstration garden. I've got the one to 500 on there and I've got it set to 200 millimeters to frame these peonies, but I want it sharp all the way from this front all the way to the back, but not in the background. I don't want those because then it gets too busy. So I, I set it up and uh, we capture in JPEG or I capture in raw C3. When you start talking about 30 images, and a lot of times I'm at, I'm at 60 images and 100 images, they just get too big. And if you do full raws, you're gonna fill up your hard drives in a, in a heartbeat. So that's why I use JPEGs at their least amount, the largest JPEG here. And then the raw C3 is very close to a regular raw. Uh, I see it on that. So here we've got tremendous amount of depth of field for 200 millimeters. So take a look at this. This is 45 images. The camera, the lens is set at, at 500 millimeters. And watch as we're going down here, where sharpness is in here now. Uh, we're doing a movie of all the shots that we took, the 45 images. And when we're done, now we're sharp over in here. And then we're going to be sharp on this little, the furthest away from me is this area here. You go to the software, you put it together, and all of a sudden, voila, you have a tremendous amount of sharpness. Now you stop it before it gets up into this area because you don't want that sharp. It'll just make it too busy. So you have that choice. And you can either make that choice when you decide how many shots you're gonna take, you had that ability in the menu, or what you can do is you can uh, remove some of the images if you took too many when you're putting them into the software. So let's talk about the prime telephoto lenses, the big telephoto lenses. Yeah, these are the expensive ones, and we'll talk about less expensive ones in a few moments here, but everything from a 400 to, eight to a full 800 millimeter 5.6. Uh, the RF 400 has been announced, the RF 600 have been announced. They are identical to the EF lenses, but they have been modified to work just perfectly straight with the R, uh, with the R cameras. Uh, keep in mind that all of these lenses uh, will work on the uh, R series by just having a mount adapter, uh, the least of which is a uh, hundred bucks. So here's some of the examples using these lenses. This is the 400 28. And the reason for, for wanting the 400 28 would be if you're doing low light, you know, the, you see the guys on the sidelines of the NFL games and, and out there where, the, where they're working under the lights. And they'll really like this particular lens because it's so fast. And you can, this one has the two X on it. It's in the middle of the day. And I did that because I needed a fast shutter speed. Here we are at a 3000th of a second. This is with a one DX. 
This is a while back and it's an F10, but this lens is very fast and very sharp. The 500 millimeter um, Mark II I used for years and the 500, normal 500 before that. And I've taken them all over the world. Uh, this one is pretty close to where I live here, the yellow-headed blackbird. These little, uh, little bee eaters are in Africa and Botswana. And it was a perfect lens to take with me. It's relatively small in the sense that I can fit it in a bag and get it up in an airplane and uh, get it to where I'm going. That seems to be important. This is with a 1.4 converter. So we're now out at 700 millimeters. Now, what happens if all of a sudden the bird is very close to you and it's even closer than you can focus? So I quickly got the uh, 2X out, put it on the 500. They gave me a thousand millimeters, still wouldn't focus on it. So I put a 25 millimeter extension tube on behind that, or actually between the 500 and the 2X is where I put that extension tube. And I can now focus this close. And all of a sudden we have somewhat of a close up lens but it's from a bird that's further out. This is recent. This is uh, just a couple, just a month or so ago. Uh, the 600 F4 uh, Mark III is one of my very favorite lenses. And I've got a 2X extender on it. That gives me 1200 millimeters. I need the shutter speed. These guys are screaming across the water. They're running on top of the water. There's no doubt about it. These are Clark's Greaves. And, uh, I want to get them doing their, this is kind of like a mating ritual. And I'm at a 4,000 second. F13 is pretty much uh, giving me a little bit of depth of field, ISO 1600, even though it's in the middle of the day to give me this fast shutter speed and the, F, and the F13. So that combination works really well. You can hand hold the 600 F4. Uh, and this is actually with a 90D. Uh, I, worked with that camera for a while and I, I actually got it because it had the uh, focus bracketing built into it but it also is a is a smaller sensor it's the APS-C sensor which gives you a 1.6 crop so this is actually 960 millimeters handheld I've got a 2,000th of a second ISO 800 and uh, so you can use some of these big lenses with some lin some cameras that are pretty sophisticated today even if they aren't the R series and the 90D is one of those cameras. That big lens, the 800, it's a, it's a monster. I have a friend who has one, which means that I have access to it. Canon sends it to me occasionally when I have a project that I need this for. And I actually put the 2X on this. This is off of my backyard. And sitting out here on a spruce, the very top of a spruce tree is a rufous hummingbird, a male rufous. I exposed for the sky which darkened the sky, the exposure was correct for that. And I had a projected flash, uh, which has a Fresnel lens on it. So I lit the bird with the flash, exposed for the background and uh, 1600 millimeters. It kind of separated them from everything that was behind them. So that's really extending out there at 1600 millimeters. So what else can you do with an 800 millimeter lens? I mean, that's, as big as it gets. I mean, that's the longest lens that Canon has out there right now. And here is what I got with the Eagle City out there in that favorite perch area at 800 millimeters. So let's put on a 1.4 converter. That's 1120 millimeters. So I've got a 2X, so let's try it with a 2X. Well, Eagle's getting bigger. He's now out there at 1600 millimeters and that's better. How about putting a 2X and a 1.4? Uh, the series two converters actually allowed you to do that, or you can put a little 12 millimeter tube behind between them and you can get them to still mate. So that's 2,240 millimeters. Uh, I'm not done yet. So now we're at uh, 3,200 millimeters. We have two 2X two converters with that little extension tube between them. We've had to kick up the ISO to 800. We're at F22, not because we wanted to be, that's what it gives us. And pretty slow shutter speed, so you better be on a tripod. And then I had, this is everything I had in my bag, a 2X, two 2Xs and a 1.4. That's 4,480 millimeters. We're being a little bit crazy here, 
But, uh, you know, if you've got it there and you want to just see what it does, we can do that. So there's where I started with the biggest lens Canon has. And this is where I ended up when I actually finished messing around. Uh, still, I could use this image. It's sharp enough for that. And with today's work in uh, the different software programs, we can sharpen it up just a little bit because with uh, three converters on there, you're tending to soften your image just a little bit. Now, these are very important lenses. I mentioned to you, I was kind of confused when Canon came out with these. What would we do with F11 lenses? Um, well, here are the reasons. And once I had, they sent them both to me. And once I worked with them, I ended up buying the 800. Uh, it's incredibly lightweight. You can handhold it. It's very fast and focused with the R series of, of lenses uh, with bodies, especially the R5 and the R6. Excellent sharpness. I'm going to show you some examples here that will probably surprise you. Uh, you have full autofocus even with the extenders. You put a 2x, 2x extender on this lens and it becomes an f22 at the very beginning and it still autofocuses. Here's the big one, less expensive. The uh, 600 is around $700. The uh, 800 is around $900. That is dirt cheap when you start talking about lenses this, with this much reach. Now, there are some considerations. You only have one f-stop and it's f11. That's the only aperture you have, but I never found that to be a real issue. And it doesn't focus that close. I already showed you what the close focus was. You know, we're out there at almost 20 feet with the uh, R800, but you're not going to get that close to really small subjects uh, if you're out there with an 800 millimeter lens. So I took the 600 out and I used it kind of not the way you would normally use a 600 millimeter lens. I used it on some flower pictures. The beauty of this lens is even though it's F11, it still throws the background out beautifully. And same thing here, you know, whether it be Boken or whatever you want to call it, it, it puts the emphasis on the subject that you're looking for here. The close focus on the 600 is 14 and three quarter feet. So I'm at my closest focus here. At some point, uh, Canon will have an extension tube for the RX and that'll help us out a little bit in that direction. So here I am walking around with this particular lens and I can walk great distances I'm up on a canyon above where the eagle nests were that I showed you. Uh, I ran into a whole bunch of turkey vultures just sitting on the rocks and I quickly grabbed the camera and at 11, I had a 1.4 converter on it. So that gives you 1120 millimeters. And then coming back, I run into a little cottontail rabbit sitting there. And even though he's in the shade, I just kicked up my ISO a little bit and he's, he's sharp, he's tack sharp. And then a little bit later, I'm uh, close to a lake and the sandhill cranes are out there. Again, with a 1.4 converter, I can walk and get as close as I feel I can get. Uh, they're yakking, talking back and forth to each other and I can get these shots handheld and working out there at 1600 ISO. These are all done with an R5. And while I'm doing this, all of a sudden I look up the canyon and here comes a couple of uh, great blue herons. They're flying. Uh, kick it up to a 3200 ISO, a four thousandth of a second. That only took me a moment. I'm at F11 because that's all I got. And uh, took off the 1.4 converter and the shutter is set for 20 frames per second and the autofocus works beautifully. It actually, in looking at the image, it was the eye uh, detection worked on this bird, even though that's a very small eye. So these are the kinds of things we can do today that I just never dreamt we would do when I started this 50 years ago. So in that same area, this is, uh, uh, the Smith Rocks State Park area here in uh, Central Oregon. I can sit on a canyon and look across at the other side of the canyon and uh, there are these uh, climbers. And I had the chance to try the different lenses from the one's position. Um, it can't get any closer. So the 800 millimeter gave me this particular shot right here. And the first one here on the left. And that was pretty nice. Put on the 1.4 converter, that gives me 1120 millimeters. Now the lens is F16. Now I went to 3200 ISO because I just need the light over here. We were in the shade over here. We still got some shade here. 
but uh, it looks pretty good. It looks really good. So then I put on the 2X. That makes this F11 lens F22. 3200 ISO still works for us. And E is sharp. Now, in order to see how sharp this is, I've got some examples here. I cropped in that image, and that's that same image you just saw. And you could look at the carabiners and all the things going on here and the sharpness. You can see what it says on his uh, chalk bag. And he's got this T-shirt with all of the writing and so forth on it. I said, well, let's crop it some more and see how sharp it really is. So this is a crop beyond this other one. And on my monitor, if I came under, I can, I can read, just barely read this telephone number on the back of this shirt. I'm gonna go backwards here. That's on this shirt right here. We're actually able to find that much detail and you can see all of this detail on here. The only thing that's kind of holding us back here is the size of the crop and the fact that we're at F22. Uh, but tell me that this uh, 800 millimeter F11 lens isn't sharp. It's phenomenal in my opinion. We use a lot, I'm talking about converters. I'm using converters quite often. I'm just never satisfied with having enough uh, reach when I'm out there. So I'm putting on 1.4 converters, whether it be for the EF lenses or with the RF lenses or the 2X. You lose one stop with the uh, 1.4s, you lose two stops with the 2X. Now, because we have the cameras today are giving us such wonderful capabilities of ISO, ISO capabilities where we can kick it up to 3200 ISO and everything, uh, we can do this. We can, stop, we can still get good images even though we have to go to this high ISOs. Now we can put in this 12 millimeter extension tube between these converters and uh, combine converter, converters. You know, so a 1.4 and a 2X can be used together. Now we don't have a uh, extension tube for the RF series yet, but when, the, when that shows up, my guess is we'll be able to maybe combine these converters as well. And that would be a wonderful way to work. I think the one to 500 could actually be extended out a little bit further. The sharpness is still there. Remember that once you put that little 12 millimeter tube on here, you cannot focus to infinity. You can focus a long ways out there but you cannot shoot the moon. I tried to photograph the moon. I was really wanting to make it really big and it would not focus on Alice and realized that I was putting converters together and that 12 millimeter tube stopped it. Okay, I mentioned that we can do this on a budget. So much for this, uh, you know, uh, uh, $13,000 lenses and that kind of stuff. You know, people are saying, well, you know, I don't really want to mortgage my house. So here are some ways that you can bring that budget down and do the things I'm talking about here on a lower budget. It may be a little bit more difficult. Maybe the quality might not be as good as what I'm showing you here, but you can come close. The other R camera bodies, the RP new is under a thousand dollars. The R, I have an R that I use on a regular basis is only 1799. So there's one way. Uh, the, the EOS R6 instead of the R5 will save you $1,400 and it's at $2,499. Um, if I had a choice between an R and an RP and that meant I, I wouldn't, you know, go out for dinner a couple of times, uh, that would uh, be worth the time to go to an R6 because that's just such an amazing camera. The EF to EOS R mount adapters. You can use all of your existing EF lenses and your EF, your existing telephotos on the R cameras. That's very important. Uh, I've got two different ones and they both work beautifully. Remember the STM F11 telephotos, the 600 and the 800. That price of those lenses is absolutely incredible when you talk about what you can get for them. Uh, the 800 millimeter would be my choice in those two, but maybe just all you need is a 600. Using extenders to increase focal lengths. Uh, they're not cheap, but at the same time, with these new lenses and cameras, the quality is still really good with these converters. Uh, when I began this 50 years ago, we wouldn't have even thought about putting an extender on anything like that. Now, also there's used equipment out there. Uh, 
people run out and buy new R3s and all of a sudden R's and even R6s might become available. So there's another way that you can save some money. So don't feel that you can't go there. So let's talk about focal length versus angle of view. A lot of times, you know, I'll use a, use a camera that has a smaller sensor on it or I've got converters on it. And I say, well, this is now equivalent to um, six or 3000 millimeters or something. And, and I get these messages back uh, from the magazine articles and they say, no, it's not. It's only a 600 millimeter lens. And yeah, at 600 millimeters, it's four degrees. But if I put on, use a camera with a, a smaller sensor, then it's 1.6 times that. And you divide that into the four degrees. So you're getting a much smaller uh, angle of view. So it is the equivalent of a lens that would have been that long. So the sensor size is very important and extenders will increase your depth of field, your uh, focal lengths as well. Uh, the angle of view of certain lenses as compared to a 35 millimeter full frame camera are 5.2 degrees at 400 millimeters and only 1.7 degrees at 1200 millimeters. But now you put on this 1.6 uh, crop factor and you can actually do that crop factor in some of your some of the cameras and you can ask for that uh, in the in the actual images that you take. But keep in mind that there are all the Rebels, the 7D Mark II, the 77D, the 90D, the M series cameras, they all have APS-C sensors. And that include that increases your effective uh, focal length by a 1.6 factor. So keep that in mind. So how far can you take this? This is, this is kind of a wow thing. It, it's, it's because I could. So this is an 800 millimeter lens. And what have I done? I put three 2X extenders, one 1.4 X extender. And don't forget, you've got the 1.6 crop factor because I'm using an EOS 7D Mark II. I did that on purpose because I wanted that 1.6 crop factor. What is the final result? If you do your math, I wasn't very good at math in, in school, but I figured it out with my computer. It's now 14,336 millimeters. That's the angle of view. This is the 800 millimeter. This is 14,336 millimeters. It is not sharp enough to use in the magazine or anything like that, but I just wanted to see what the maximum was. You know, I don't know if I could have gotten any more if I, if I would have had any more friends that came with me that had converters that were cannons but that's what was going on here with several of us and we all had this gear and I had the 800. So he said, what the heck, let's see what, what we can do. And look for a laugh, but it shows you that it's possible. So you got these long lenses. How are we going to, to get these sharp images that you're seeing here and make sure? Well, tripods and the tripod heads are important. Hand-holding techniques is important. Higher shutter speeds, higher ISOs, you need to use a remote release if you're working on something on a tripod in like a nest or something. And the camera output monitors can help us quite a bit, the same as a remote release. So hand-holding. Uh, well, <laughs> this lens was sent to me a few years back and uh, it's the old 1200 millimeter, EF 1200 millimeter F5.6. And it came out in July, 1993. It was a derivative of an FD lens that had been out there. Uh, I looked it up in the Canon Museum, Lens Museum. And at the time that they came out with it, it was 9,800,000 yen. And in today's dollars, that's $88,484. It was 36.4 pounds. The case and the, and the, uh, the crate that it came in was actually uh, close to a hundred pounds by the time the whole thing was was there. So that's not the kind of handholding that we're really gonna talk about here. You gotta have a son that has a good strong shoulder in order to, to do it this way. So I went through all my images of me with the cameras out there and I found very few pictures of me handholding because I tend to use a tripod whenever I possibly can. 
But when you do have to use a hand holding, and now with these STM 600s and 800s, I will use more of the hand holding capabilities. So let's look at what you have to do. You keep your left hand under the center of the lens, support it and facilitate maybe manually focusing because these cameras can go both autofocus and you can override with manual focus. Plant your elbows into the edge of your body. That's incredibly important. I see people with their wings out, with their elbows out and the lens is just all over the place. A very soft touch in the shutter release. Do not torque the camera, rotate it. Keep it still if working with fast, fast frame rates because you know you might get the first one is sharp and the second one is not. You can kind of do a little bit of breathing exercise while you're taking those so you're not breathing in the middle of your sh shooting. Tripods, tripods, these are old tripods. And I put these in here because, well, number, number one, you can get these similar tripods from d &H, no problem. But uh, these are Getzos here. And these are the heads that I use. These are the two heads that I use all the time. But they're like 20 years old because if you buy a good tripod to start with, a really good one, it will last a long time. And I don't, I'm not planning on replacing these tripods anytime soon. So they'll probably last my whole career. So looking closely here, this is a Gitzo. It's a gimbal, but it has a uh, fluid fluid head cartridge built into here and up in here. And I'm gonna show you a video at the end that shows you how well this will work with videos if you're doing slow motion videos. And I use ball heads a lot. And this is another one of the smaller, a lighter tripod. This is my bigger tripod, depending upon what kind of work I'm doing. Here's the next technique is faster shutter speeds. My lowest shutter speed I will use if I'm photographing flying birds is generally a 3,000th of a second. And this is a Peregrine Falcon, fastest of the birds. So you really need to, I'd like to have more than 3,000th of a second. Uh, it, would, it would help. I was lucky here, I got everything sharp within them. And of course the background is, un, is out, of, out of focus. This is the one to 500 handheld. I'm at F11 to get a little bit of depth of field. I'm at ISO 3200 so I can get this 3,000th of a second because I've got to have it. Higher ISOs. I've played around with the uh, latest cameras, the uh, R5 and the R6, and I use 1600 ISO a lot now, and it's beautiful, it's wonderful. This one, because the sun has gone down and it's the RF800 at F11, I'm still able to shoot at a 500th of a second because I'm at ISO 12,800. Yeah, the quality isn't the same as it would be at 800 or something down in that lower range, but it's well, you know, it's better to do that than not shoot at all. And the quality that we get these days is just amazing. How about the remote releases and monitors? Well, there are all kinds of electronic releases out there. This is one of the Canon releases. It has a, a ability to, to do time lapses and things with it. So it's quite, there are, you know, simple ones also that Canon makes that will work into here. Uh, this is something you should know. Canon Camera Connect. This one's free. You've got a smartphone. This is an iPhone here uh, with the R5 and the R6. It connects with the latest version of the software. It's a Bluetooth. It will connect you immediately. You can see what your camera is seeing. You don't have to touch your camera. You can change it from up here, we have from stills to video. We have shutter speeds. We have f-stops. We have ISOs. We just touch that button and it fires the camera. You can change whether you're going from uh, high speed to single shots. The, uh, the AF, I'm not sure exactly what the sensors here. Here we're changing the, the, uh, the lights, whether it's daylight or whether, you know, what, what you're going to use auto auto uh, color balance is the color balance area. So this is very important. And you probably already have the tools. You just need to download the Canon Camera Connect. Now this is a little more advanced. I'm gonna show you a video from the Eagle's Nest that I did a, a 4K video of for the uh, State Park. And this is the Cam Ranger 2. And it sends an ad hoc Wi-Fi from here to your 
in this case, it's an iPad Pro, which is pretty good sized. And I can touch anywhere on here and change the focus. I can change the shutter speed that stops. Everything that we can do over here, but it's really large. And uh, I'm sitting there for hours at a time and it allows me to really watch what's going on in the camera. So we're gonna talk a little bit about video uh, from the RC, R series cameras, which means the RP, the R, the R6 and the R5. Here are the important things that you need to consider here. Uh, can they do 4K? Yes, all of them can do 4K. This one at 24 frames per second. This one at 30 frames per second. This one, the R6 is at 30 and 60 frames per second. And the R5 at 4K is at 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. That's nice slow motion. And we're gonna show you that. And it does 8K. And even though I don't have a whole lot of use for 8K, I'm gonna show you a place where maybe you do. Uh, there's a crop factor, 1.6 when you go to video, 1.83 when you go to video uh, from your lenses. Uh, very little crop factor on the R6 and very little crop factor, if any, on the R5. So keep in mind, if you're going to do a video frame grab, that's what we're going to talk about next. You get the equivalent of an 8.3 megapixel camera with these at 4K, any of them at 4K. But if you shoot an 8K, 8K clip, and you take out a frame capture, you have the equivalent of a 35.4 megapixel frame. And that's pretty good. So here's, you've taken a, you've taken a little bit of video and you look at, it, look at it on the back. When you click on this, up will come this menu. And with this menu here, you can go, you can start the video, you can start at the beginning of the video, the end of the video, you can go one frame at a time going forward, one frame at a time going backwards. It shows you where you are in the video clip. And you can actually edit here. I don't use this feature, but this is important. This one's really important. So you look at the video clip and you click on this with what frame you've stopped it at here. And once you do that, that's the frame you've got. You ask, it asks you, do you want this to be a still image? And if you say, okay, it becomes a JPEG and it goes onto your card. And later on, you can use it as a regular still image. And that's a clip out, just a one frame out of your clip. And then you, after you say, okay, you can either go back to the movie or you can uh, view more, uh, you can view that extracted still image. So here's a little video clip. I used the first frame, so it stopped here at the moment. So this very first, now this is the video clip continuing, and then I want that frame. So I stopped it there, and I said, I wanna, I wanna use this frame as well. This is from an 8K video uh, at 1200 millimeters. And now let's look at, that's the video, that's the still. I've worked on a little bit in Photoshop, and it's, as if I had a camera that had 35 megapixels. It's pretty amazing. And it's at 30 frames per second. Here's that second frame that I stopped. And you can see here that the quality and everything is pretty amazing. It, it really works well. Now, 4K, th those were from an 8K. This is an EOS R and I'm using 4K video at 30 frames per second. I've got the 600 millimeter lens, I'm hand holding it because I'm following these uh, eagles around. I knew this eagle was gonna go down the canyon and come right back towards me. And I was ready for him. And I took a video of him coming towards me. And then I took this frame out of that. So because of the eight point, or because of the, uh, the, the crop factor of the video on the R is 1.83, uh, this is the equivalent of 1,096 millimeters. But look at the sharpness, look at the capability. Uh, it's very usable very usable. Now this is in the nest. I've got the 600 with the 2X and the 1.4, that's 1,680 millimeters. And with the crop factor, it's 2,906 millimeters. I'm more than 200 feet away from this nest. And I'm showing you what's being fed to the kids in that, and it's nice and sharp. And it's equivalent of, again, an 8.3 uh, megapixel camera, but it's good. It's very good. So when you do a video like this, and we're talking a little bit about using these long lenses for videos with your uh, DSLRs, in, in this case, in our, our cameras and EF 
and uh, the DSLR EOS cameras as well. This is a 1DX Mark II, and this is the 5D Mark IV. And this is what I use to do this uh, 10 minute video that they use at the state park. But look at all this equipment I've got. And I've got to get in there and I'm more than a mile from where I parked the car. So I found this uh, online. I found this cart and it's a German thing. And I can put all of this gear on here and the two tripods and everything else. And if the seat comes down, I can actually sit there once I get tired, which can be, you know, except that I'm bringing my own chair as well. So this is what it takes to do long lens videos, uh, and in this case, 4K. And I'm going to show you a little part of that, not the full 10 minutes, but just a minute of it coming up. Also the extenders as well. So that gives you some idea of what we can do in, with the 4K video on a nest that's more than 200 feet away. Um, from a legal standpoint, we're, we were right out there at the limit. And uh, I want to be able to see what's going on in the nest as well as the overall uh, pictures. And, and uh, it can be done. Now, this next video gives you an idea of what we're doing today with the EOS R5 and with the RF100 to 500. And this little get so gimbal fluid head. I've used several different fluid heads and uh, some of them worked really well. Some, most of them are very expensive. You can't just use a regular ball head or anything because to follow a subject with a telephoto lens that we're using here, uh, it's gonna be jerky. So take a look at this little video. We're gonna finish here with this and uh, then we'll take some questions in just here a moment. This is a very short video. So let's take a look. So keep in mind that um, this, the smoothness, the smoothness of these videos are a little bit jumpy here simply because of the bandwidth uh, coming onto the zoom 
area here. But uh, if you're looking at it directly on your monitors and everything, it is perfectly smooth. I'm just blown away by the capabilities of that particular uh, tripod head. I've sold a number of them to friends who have looked at my videos. So let's, I'm gonna turn this off and uh, time for Eric and David to come back on here. Thanks, George. Yeah, what uh, an amazing uh, presentation. I'm, I'm kind of blown away, but I, I, I knew, you know, I already know what you're capable of, but I mean, there's lots of people that, that look at, you know, taking the, ex the extenders to the limits of what's possible. And that's one of the things I love about your work is that you, 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 you make these things, uh, you use them in areas that, you know, you, you wouldn't have thought of before and, and just ex take them to the limits of what's possible. So I'm sure a lot of people really appreciate that. We do have some questions. David, did you have anything you want to say before we get into questions? I just want to say uh, thank you, George. I mean, the, the work is the work is pinpoint perfect. Uh, you really push the technology. And before we get into the questions, uh, what I love about you, George, is that you really adapted to the new digital technology. You went over that history. We talked before. I'm a T90 man myself, uh, <laughs> but it's it's pretty impressive how you you grew with that and uh, really. Uh, leveraging the technology to achieve what you want to do. And it's refreshing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate, you know, uh, George being George, uh, having the, you know, he really embraces the technology, uh, to your point, David. And um, many just kind of say, oh, I'm just going to stick with what I have. But George really is at the forefront of what's available and he uses it to his advantage, especially with that Eagle's Nest. Uh, it's just amazing seeing what you do there. Um, so if you're ready for some questions, uh, we could take them now. So if, you, if you're ready, George, I'll, I'll sure. fire away. Um, Mike had asked, uh, when using both the 1.4 and the 2X teleconverters sep uh, separated by the 12 millimeter extension tube, which teleconverter should be attached to the camera, the 1.4 or the 2X? Well, the answer is that it really doesn't make any difference. Uh, it, it will make a difference as to what your exit data is because whichever lens is next to the camera body is the one that's going to show up uh, in the exit data. It, if you've got two converters, it'll only give you the information from the first one. But as far as changing anything else, no, it doesn't make any difference. If you put a bigger extension tube on like I did with the uh, hummingbirds and, and a few other things, uh, you need to put that extension tube next to the lens and then the converters after that. That's not the 12 millimeter tube between the, between the extenders. That's an actual extension tube. Right on, right on. Um, so from YouTube, Lee Gardner asks, for images of flowers and still life subjects, do I need a telephoto lens more than a 300 or 400? Now, actually... The, the three four hundreds will do very very nice for flower photography. I'm I'm taking it to the nth degree here at five hundred millimeters to do all these flowers. Now the other question is, I did that at this demonstration garden because I couldn't walk out into the flower beds. So the three to four hundred should be enough, and it should really throw your backgrounds out of focus. Uh, take put in just enough. Uh, for your depth of field, choose the f-stop that will give you just what you need. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's situational, right, George? I mean, yes, uh, you know, That's the answer to everything, as I say, oftentimes is it depends. Uh, it depends on the situation you're in. So. Um, that's why you've got those big guns, right? That you can carry all that gear with. So um, great. So um, this is a question about the, the 600 and the 800 uh, F11 STM lenses. And um, Mike asks, he says, the F11 lens seems uh, slow for a long lens. Does it mean higher ISO settings? Absolutely. But that's the beautiful thing about the fact that we have um, so much better ISO capabilities of all of the recent cameras. And uh, you come to the R6 and the R5 and it's over the top. I've never seen anything quite as, as works as well as this. So uh, yes, you're definitely gonna have to go to higher ISOs. Nothing's for free and that's where you go, but they're giving us a lot more for our, for our, you know, for our money these days. 
Yeah. And, and on those lenses, they're, uh, you know, they're super light. If you haven't had a chance to get one in your hands yet, um, the, they just, there's nothing else like them on the market right now. Um, and yes, while they're F11 and a little on the slow side, there's that, that trade-off, right? Uh, for those that can't or won't carry around, uh, you know, the 600 or the 800 millimeter um, EF lenses and now the RF lenses, the big white ones, uh, this is a really great opportunity for people that want to get into super telephoto photography that couldn't have done it uh, either physically or financially before. So they're really a good option. And high ISO, of course, as George, uh, to George's point is, yes, it's part of the name of the game. Um, but with great lighting, uh, it's, you know, you're going to get uh, images that are a little bit more uh, on the lower ISO side when you're working in full sun. But in the image that George showed, even at dusk in, uh, you know, in the shade, uh, you can still push the limits of the camera to get great images at higher ISO. So um, great question though. Uh, so Dan asks, does focus bracketing get processed in camera or do you need to download uh, the, the X number of images that you've taken uh, into another software? You're going to compile those images in a software in your computer. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about in the camera here is the fact that you can set the focus and it automatically, you know, and it only takes a, a second or two to go through like 30, 40, 50 images in the camera. But now you take all of those images on your card, you bring them into the computer, put them into a folder, and then a program like Zarine Stacker, you put them in there uh, and it puts it together and all of a sudden you have infinite sharpness almost. I mean, it's not perfect. You still have to learn to work with that system and it works beautifully. Yeah, so I, I've been using Zarine Stacker uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the George Lepp uh, workshop I did with him a number of years ago. And um, it's an amazing uh, software for that, but you can do it in the Canon software as well. Digital Photo Professional will also put those together for you. Uh, so Steve has asked, uh, when tracking, when subject tracking, uh, or what, excuse me, what subject tracking AF mode do you recommend for using with flying, flying hummingbirds with the R5? I have a, a bit of a modified, uh, number two, and I can't off the top of my head tell you how I've set that up, but I use the number two and I'm using I generally have the camera set for eye for eye tracking. And if the eye is big enough, it will track it. And if it's not, it'll go to the animal tracking. And uh, between those two things, um, it works beautifully. Yeah, it, it really changes the game, especially for wildlife photographers trying to focus on birds. Because when you had uh, maybe perhaps even a cluster of points with a DSLR EOS camera, you have to maintain that those points on your subject, unless you're using all points active. Uh, but the, having that, that subject tracking available to you, uh, learn to trust it because it's really uh, impressive on how it works. And, and it, at the end of the day, you're going to have more uh, images that are keepers than you would otherwise, which you know, allows you to be able to uh, really fine tune your, your real final picks. Uh, it's a lot easier to to uh, throw away the ones that are out of focus because it's, it's obviously not going to work. But when you have more in focus, it makes it uh, a lot easier to really pick the best one because you're choosing from the sharp images. So uh, John had asked, uh, when would you use a crop sensor camera rather than simply cropping a full frame image? Well, I'm, I'm going to basically try to fill the frame any chance I can. Uh, that's why I go to these long, long lenses is I'm trying to fill the frame. But there are times like those uh, running grebes that I showed you that one picture of where the two grebes, those are pretty much full frame, but I still might just do a little bit of cropping there to clean it up. But I'm always trying to fill the frame. Uh, the less cropping you do, the better your quality. So that's the point of, uh, you know, some, some folks get really, really high quality images and some people they're kind of on the edge and it may be because of the fact that they're having to do a lot of cropping. Now, I've got people who come to this uh, eagle nest that I've shown you here 
and they've only got a, a, one, a, a one to 400 and maybe a 1.4 converter onto it. And then they send me some pictures later and they're almost the same size as mine. It's because they're cropping the living daylights out of it. And on the monitor, it looks really good. So in a, in a similar kind of topical matter, Ed had asked, since you're using an R5, it's 45 megapixels, would you get a better final image by shooting the 800 millimeter without extenders and then crop maybe and resize with uh, Topaz or Gigapixel or Photoshop versus shooting uh, with all those extenders? You shoot with what you got. Your best lens is the lens that you have available. So if you only have an 800 and they're way the hell out there running on the water, then yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna do the cropping. But if you have that 600 F4 with a 2X, you'll go to that. So what I'm basically gonna say is it all depends and you're gonna use what you have. And we have the option now of cropping, which we really didn't have that much in earlier years. Yeah, so it brings up a good point. You had mentioned uh, with the Eagle's Nest in particular, you, you have a limit as far as how close you can get. Is, was that a, a, in a park, in a, in a state park or national park? Or how, how, how are people to know how close they can get to the nest? Well, there's laws which say you have to be, I think, 230 feet away from an active nest. And that goes for no matter where you go. And if you're in a state park, and people know, the, the rangers know where that nest is and they know who you are. Uh, I would suggest strongly that you follow the rules because you can find yourself you know, with a summons or a, a ticket. Uh, but in the case where I'm working on that nest, there's a, it's a tree out in a canyon. I'm on a, the edge of a, uh, the canyon itself. So I can't get any closer, but you need to know what's legal before you start moving in close to something like a raptor of some sort. Yeah, word to the wise. Yeah, good good advice. Um, Mike had asked, uh, there's a lot of questions from, from Mike's here today. We've got a, quite a few Mike's in the, in the questions and answers here. But uh, so will the EF extension tube accept the RF camera adapter? So the answer is no. uh, yes. Oh, wait, so, oh, the, go ahead, will go ahead, the go ahead. EF adapter, hold, yes. The EF adapter will work with any of the um, EF uh, accessories or anything uh, on that end of it. You right. cannot put an EF um, without the adapter onto the cameras, but and the RF cameras, uh, the RF lenses cannot be adapted to a standard um, EOS camera. Right. So, so that goes for extent for the uh, tele extenders as well. You can't put those on your uh, EOS DSLR. They will only work. So you can go from EF to RF. You just can't go the other way around. Correct. So, okay. Uh, Sharon asked, can any brand extension tube be used between the extenders? Uh, I would say yes, but I would be very careful. Uh, there are pins that you're working with there. And there may be some certain uh, inexpensive accessories out there that you might put on there and you might shear those pins. So I would say be really careful. And when you first try it, do it very gently to make sure that you're not gonna run up against those pins. And that's why we generally stay with Canon uh, tubes. Uh, simply, I mean, I've used other tubes in the past to do all these different weird things, but uh, be careful. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Just be careful. Um, the I mean, there's no optics in extension tubes, so um, the, I mean, you can stick your finger right through there. Just it's always and they're not super expensive, uh, relatively speaking. So um, it it's always good advice, no matter what camera you're using, to to stick with camera manufacturer uh, accessories like that. That's always good advice. Um, Ed had asked, "Do do you use L brackets?" I'm assuming because if you want to switch to vertical on your gimbal, uh, can you just do that real quick? With I'm assuming that's the, the genesis of the question. The, the answer to that is yes and no. The answer is that we're generally working with these big lenses. They all have collars. And uh, that allows you, except, except for those uh, STM, the 11, F11, 600, and 800, they do not have collars. And an L bracket there is very important. 
uh, or a way to flip that. Well, an L bracket on the body, on the camera body is not gonna help you very much. But the main thing here is that, yes, in some cases without big telephotos, I do work with L brackets, but in, with the big lenses, L brackets aren't a factor because you've got a rotating collar. Right now on the, on the 600 and the 800 uh, F11 lenses, there is a, a mount on the lens. There's a, there's a, a quarter 20 screw that just doesn't rotate like the, the high price spread lenses uh, right. that George was just mentioning. So just in case you were wondering. Um, okay, so um, I, I don't know the name here. It's hard to, to pronounce, but I'll, I'll read the question. Um, are you changing ISO as lighting conditions change or using auto ISO? I very seldom use auto ISO. I like to know what my ISO is going to be. I'll set my ISO and that'll tell me what my shutter speeds are going to be. And if I don't like my shutter speed, I kick up my ISO. So this is basically done manually. I do not use auto ISO very often. Uh, Straub had asked uh, if uh, there are any adapters that allow Canon RF lenses to be used on a Sony 7R camera. Uh, <laughs> I, don't think so. I don't think so either at this point. Um, that's not to say that they won't exist at some yeah. point, but um, since George and I are both Canon, um, we can't speak to other manufacturers and what, what they have or don't have available. So as far as we know, there's nothing available right now, but uh, that would be the answer to that. So Mike asks... Use that 800 and 600 on their Sony. Yeah, yeah. So Mike asks, is it necessary to separate each set of Canon teleconverters with a short extension tube when using two or more teleconverters? Okay. Depending upon which set of Canon teleconverters you have, the Mark III's, yes, you have to put two converters together, you need the 12 millimeter tube. If you have the Mark II teleconverters, then they will mate together. Uh, I can't remember which, it's only one way. The, the, I think the 1.4 has to be on top of the, the, the other one. But uh, again, it depends on which converters you have. But the Mark III is the best ones. No, you, you do have to have a 12 millimeter tube. Yeah, because there's a little lens that juts out and you do physically can't put them together um, without that, without that little space in between. So that's what the, the extension tube is really, uh, providing for you there. Uh, Bob had asked in handling long lens, for example, like the 100 to 400, um, with an extender, getting it onto a tripod, I would think that one has to be careful in mounting that camera after the lens is secured to the tripod. Um, well, it's always, you know, you always need to be careful and you need to make sure that the indent, the little pin that goes into the, into the lens or into the other converter clicks in because if it doesn't and you're not paying attention and you stick this thing over your shoulder and you start walking away, the camera body is going to fall off. So that's one of the most important things is to make sure that the indent goes into the lens in front of it. Good advice. It's, it always sucks when you have a lens that you're walking around and it all of a sudden falls off. I've had it happen to me. So it's not a comforting feeling. So uh, Mike Lawson had asked uh, what, what the music was from the, from the last video you used. He wants to put it on his top, uh, on his list there. These, the music that you hear on my videos are from buyout music. Um, so there's a company that I use and I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but it's, it's made especially to sell to photographers or, or videographers that want to put it with their videos. So it is not the name of anything that uh, I can give to you. It's something that I use and cut and paste to make it the right length and everything. So it's buyout music. Yeah. Um, Bob had asked, uh, we wanted to know what the manufacturer was of the cart that you had that shown uh, they should uh, tell them to send me an email. Hey, and Bob, send George an email. In fact, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be selling the one that I have simply because I'm not carrying that much gear anymore. I, after my last back surgery, I'm I'm taking just smaller, lighter lenses and not doing the full 4K uh, full video thing out miles into the background but have them send me an email to to 
uh, George at georgelep.com. Two P's on, on uh, LEP. Uh, um, so uh, kind of in that same uh, realm, Gabrielle asked, when photographing, do you often have an assistant with you or a trainer? Because you see a lot of these birds and animals get scared uh, of the camera. Um, I work in a blind in a lot of cases. I generally work quite often by myself. The eagle nest is so far away from the nest uh, that there's generally somebody else sometimes out there. Uh, when I was doing the video, I was out there from before sunrise until about 11, 12 o'clock in the, in the morning. So, you know, six, seven, eight hours. Uh, most people don't want to go out there with me to take a couple of shots. Uh, and I stayed out there. So I'm usually by myself on something like this. And generally, if there's a situation where I'm going to scare the birds, uh, I'm going to be in a blind. And if I'm walking and scaring the birds, um, that doesn't generally work. So you've got to find a way to get closer to those birds without scaring them up. So again, tying this into the blind category, Frederick asked uh, from YouTube, um, how do you determine where to set up a blind, number one? And number two, where can you get a blind? There's a number of blinds out there. If you, if you Google it, um, you can find that there's a couple of companies that make very good blinds. I used to, I used to market them myself, but I don't any longer. Uh, but that's, that's one of the things that you can do. Uh, and I, tri, Tripan, I think, is one of the companies that makes a really good blind. As far as where to put the blind, uh, you start further away from the area. If they're on a nest or something, you have to be very careful. You have to move it slowly. And the minute that you're causing a ruckus or causing a problem with the, with the animal, then you pull the blind back out. I put it, depending upon where I can put it, uh, as far as the land and everything is concerned. And the other thing is where the light's going to come from during the time of day that I'm going to be photographing. So there's all kinds of considerations. This, this old adage, you know, it depends. Yeah. Um, so Bob had asked, <laughs> this is kind of a leading question, probably more for, for Canon here, uh, us, but uh, uh, you mentioned the RF extension tube, any other info, or are you just wishing them, uh, wishing out loud? I have friends asking for them too. So uh, the answer, Bob, is uh, we, we have no information right now on products or future products that will be announced. Um, I know George mentioned that at some point we'll probably have them and, and he's probably right there. Um, you know, the system has been out since 2018 and I know the engineers at Canon are feverishly designing um, lenses and accessories uh, as quickly as they can to get them out so that they are the best possible uh, quality product that can, they can make. Um, and that's one of the hallmarks of the RF uh, optical system is just it's the whole system is really centered around the optical story. Uh, so you've probably heard that the RF optics are just outstanding and that would be very accurate. And to George's uh, point, he, that's why he's using them right now uh, because of that optical quality. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, but the answer is really, we don't know at this point. Um, so uh, I'll go to another question from Mike. Do you use polarizing filters on those big lenses? Uh, I have polarizing filters, drop-in polarizing filters. And the one of the adapters that I have between EF and RF uh, is the one that has the filters that drop into it. And you can actually do a polarizer or a uh, neutral density filter that you can adjust. Uh, so that is an, that is something you can do. Very seldom do I need to do that unless I'm looking for long exposures along the coast or something with my telephoto lens. There I have used those. Yeah, yeah. And the, the cool adapter, the uh, EF to RF adapter where that has the two drop-in filters George was just referencing. The, um, I mean, when you're shooting wildlife, when you're, okay, I'll rephrase, when you're photographing wildlife, right, George? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you're generally looking for as fast a shutter speed as you can get. And uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, polarizers are going to take about a stop and a half of light away from that. And that could be critical for getting those fast shutter speeds that you need. So oftentimes wildlife photographers generally aren't using that, but of course, landscape photographers for sure uh, will be using polarizing filters. But that's one of the nice things about that. Um, you know, if you follow some of our other uh, Canon explorers of light, uh, they're using like these wide angle lenses like the 11 to 24 
and you put that on an EOS R5 and drop in the uh, polarizer or the neutral density filter, which is a one and a half to nine stop neutral density filter, um, you can really, you know, those lenses are so big with that bulbous looking glass on the front. Uh, you can't really put a polarizer on those in the front. You have to do it in the back. So uh, that's where that really comes in. Um, so that hopefully answered that question. Uh, let's see. What are the Canon stacker? What is the Canon stacker software? So that really is uh, when you do the stacking in camera or the focus bracketing is what it's officially called. Um, the digital photo professional software will stack those images for you. Uh, that's comes free with your camera. You can download it from the Canon website, but the other one that George was referencing was called Zarine stacker from Zarine systems.com. Is that correct, George? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And that's a really great software. Um, let's see. Uh, where do you start stacking on the, uh, on the basic, when you start stacking, where do you go? Do you start at the closest? Like what's your procedure for doing that, George? That, that's from Gusra. You start at the closest point that you want in focus and you guesstimate how far it's gonna, with the increment that you've chosen, how many it's gonna to take to get past the area you want in focus. I always choose more than I think I'm gonna need and I can always drop them out when I run them into the folder in the computer. I'll go through and say, I don't need anything beyond this and I'll throw those away. So you always start with the closest to the lens that you're going to want the focus. Good. So Bob had, had, had more of a comment than a question, but we could we could expand upon it. Focus tracking is is counterintuitive. Smaller subjects really need bigger focus points or clusters. Uh, makes it easier to keep the focus point on the subject. Um, you want to comment on that, and then I can actually weigh in as well. Well, when. Everything that I'm shooting now from these flying birds and, and even hummingbirds in my backyard and so forth, um, I, like I said, I set it to the eye control. And if there's an eye big enough, whether it's a small subject or a large subject, and no matter how it's moving, if it can, if the autofocus finds that, finds that eye, it goes right there immediately. And if it doesn't, as you saw with that uh, barn owl that was flying towards me, it switches to a cluster uh, and I have that set to be on the nine, nine or so center, um, se the sensors in the autofocus is I generally work with, uh, but so often it finds the eyes and uh, it, it has made it much simpler than it has ever had, has been before. Before I would work with anything from, uh, when I went with the long lenses, quite often I would only have one sensor in the center and that's all I would have and now because the R5 and the R6 has this capability of working with more sensors, even with lower light, uh, it pretty much works on its own. Yeah, and, and that would be, um, you know, the question kind of leads me into a, a, the, the kind of corner that you haven't had maybe opportunity to work with the new tracking system on the R5 or R6 compared to a DSLR. And yes, you are absolutely right. When, when you're working with a DSLR, you know, EOS camera or any other, uh, general rule of thumb is, yeah, the larger focus point or cluster of points that you work with, the better chance you're going to have of getting uh, a sharp image with a moving, especially a subject moving like a bird that's moving very erratically. Uh, but this changes the game. And that's, the, that's where technology has really um, expanded uh, our ability to get uh, sharp images with that. So I see uh, David Brommer's in the room. I know we've got a lot of questions, but are we re have we reached the limit of where we can be uh, with this? We've gone a, a, a cool hour and a half. <laughs> and uh, I know there's a lot of questions about uh, equipment specifically. And just want to let everyone know that uh, this weekend on Sunday and Monday during Optic, uh, there will be Canon uh, tech reps on, on call and in our Expo Trade Show room. So they could answer those questions as well. And Eric, are you are you on the? Uh, will you be joining us this weekend? I will be. I'll be uh, moderating both Sunday and Monday for the Canon uh, uh, events. I know we have uh, Canon uh, Explorer like Jen Wu, uh, Jennifer Wu will be doing a presentation on landscape photography. Uh, we have a presentation on Monday on specifically the Canon RF optics. 
uh, that we'll be doing. And then um, I think there's uh, there was one other. Oh, we've got uh, what to do before you print. That's on Sunday. Uh, so those that are interested in printing and trying to set your printer up, uh, Ross Joseph from Canon will be covering all those little things that you need to set up before you actually hit the print button. So that's going to be very informative. Okay. I believe we actually have the, the full schedule is fully published online now. So I, I really right. recommend our dedicated optic viewers actually kind of map out their, their day, how they want to approach optic and make sure you catch everything. And like I always tell people, uh, that the presentations in the expo rooms are not recorded. So go see the expo first and then main stage and creator stage, you can always watch later on because those are recorded. And also, George, thank you so much. You gave out a ton of information, yeah. like a real lot. Uh, good news that we did, we did record today and we will have uh, today's, you'll be able to watch it again on YouTube. And we'll also have a link on our, our website as soon as we get done processing it and, and making sure it's all good. So this was uh, this was a great hour and a half. Um, you know, lenses are, are just so important and boy, those camera bodies just keep getting better and better, but, but wow, the lenses are really keeping up with them as well. And uh, I think it's just a great time to be in photography because the technology really lends itself so well to what we wanna do. Um, I don't know, George, do you, uh, do you miss uh, being limited to, uh, Kodachrome 64 and, and only having <laughs> maybe going for PKL and shooting at, at 200 ISO. <laughs> Do not miss that in any shape or form. I could not go back to film if I had to. Uh, I haven't used any film whatsoever since 2001. Wow. Okay. I, I'm still a film guy, George. Just gotta let you know. I, I still shoot, but I, I, I do it purely for the process and the fun of it. When I'm, when I'm getting serious, the digital cameras come out. So right on. Um, it was a pleasure to have you again, George. Thank you so much. I'm really happy that you're part of Optic. And uh, there's just a, a vast amount of, of content that comes out of Optic. And wow, you could really dive into it, just learn so much. And, and you're a part of that. So thank you so much for your contribution uh, to the technical and the aesthetic aspects of photography all these years. Thank you. Good to see you again. As well. Take care, Eric. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. See you this Sunday. Signing All right. Bye-bye now.